Curiosity. That's a thread that comes through all of us and a good part of the reason why we are here today. Independent of who we are, our race, our age, our background, our profession, this innate desire of learning. But why are we curious? Maybe it is to satisfy that desire, and that's it. Or maybe it's more profound. Maybe it's because of some version of Darwin's principle that with curiosity, we can have an edge on survival. If we look at the history of humankind, we realize that there's a cycle linked to curiosity on natural phenomena. Curiosity leads us to try to understand these phenomena. And when we understand them, we try to predict them, to know when they happen, and in what shape, and where. And when we know how to predict them, we learn how to control them. When we control them, we can turn them into technologies, which allows us to do things much better than what we were doing before, for example, or much more efficiently, or faster, if we drive instead of walking. Or maybe it allows us to do things that it was impossible to do before, for example, going up to the moon. So when we look at back at the history of mankind, we can look at example of the cycle. The first one I'll pick is fire. Initially, fire was something which was random, came in with storms, lightnings, fire on a tree. And suddenly humans are, were able to realize that it was not that random. Maybe we could produce it by taking rocks and putting them together, putting fire around other rocks and keep them in some certain area. And then with this, we're able suddenly to do things that we couldn't do before, cook meals. Maybe we were able also to melt metals and so they make tools. Initially, these tools were probably used to hunt better. But suddenly we started to use these tools to do something different, to do agriculture. And this had prof a profound impact on society. Because with agriculture, we could gather more resources and keep them for longer, and suddenly we could have a higher density of human beings. We can turn being from nomadic tribe to having small village here and there. If we fast forward about 20,000 years, then we can see that cycle again when we add the fires, which was boiling water and producing steam. And suddenly we learn how to understand and predict how steam works, that it was a transfer of heat from the fire to another form of heat. Then there was something very interesting at that time that we turned into our understanding and prediction and control, not only from anecdotal and uh, words of mouth, uh, information which was passing, but using mathematics to try to understand things. And that was profound because it's unbelievable how, it's unreasonable how effective mathematics is to describe the world around us. And allow us to transform this and control this team to produce new technologies. It allows us to make not only tools, new types of tools, but tools which makes tools. Allows us to make a new set of engines based on steam, which led to the locomotive. And again, the locomotive had an incredible impact on society, because not only we could go and get, gather resources, which we could go by foot now, but much further away with the locomotive. And this allowed us to increase the density of human beings, and not only having villages, but having towns. And so the world, or the perception of the world of people, became much, much broader and very different. A few hundred years after, another force of nature was named, the one based on electricity and magnetism. The physicist, the British physicist, James Clerk Maxwell, realized that electricity and magnetism were two facets of the same coin, that looking in different ways, electricity could be turned into 
magnetism and the other way around. He was able to set up a set, up a set of equation called Maxwell's equation and try to study them and show how this happens. But the very neat thing about these Maxwell's equation was that he could predict a new type of thing out of them. He could predict that there would be some waves, electromagnetic wave, that are, could be seen. And these electromagnetic waves are really at the foundation of information technology that we have today, that we can communicate not only between you and me in front, but also anywhere else around the world. That certainly the whole world or the whole planet, it is, is at our fingertip. And again, a profound influence on the way we perceive the world, one where suddenly we're completely part of it, we're part of what is called the global village. So if we look at these phenomena of nature which were harnessed and understood and turned into technology from the past, we can turn around and say, what are the forces of nature that we have around today, which are, can have the potential of transforming our life the same way as fire or steam or like electromagnetism? And this is a prediction for the future. Some are right and some are wrong. But there is one force of nature that has been around us for about 100 years that we start to really understand, predict, and control, which is the behavior of the world on the very small scale, the behavior of atoms and molecules. And this is described by a theory called quantum mechanics. We first saw the quantum mechanical phenomena because we were trying to explain them, explain experiments with atoms and molecules with the laws of physics inherited from Newton, Galileo, and Maxwell, and it failed. And we needed a new framework, and suddenly this new framework allowed new phenomena to occur and new possibilities. And I'll talk about two properties of quantum mechanics which are being turned into technology. The first one is called the superposition principle. When we describe objects today, we describe them by telling them where they are and what is the, their velocity. And with this, with the laws of physics, we can tell where they will be and which velocity they will have in the future. In quantum mechanics, when we try to describe system, it turns out that we can describe the position, or it, the quantum mechanics allows position of object to be at two places at once. That molecules and atoms can be here and there at the same time. That sounds to be completely crazy, completely counterintuitive. But we go in the lab, we do experiments, and this is the way that we can explain what is happening. In fact, the Austrian uh, physicist, Erwin Schrodinger, tried to think how ridiculous this was by thinking of if you would have a bullet, which would be here and there at the same time, and you would put a cat here at only one side, then suddenly this cat could become dead and alive at the same time. <laughs> and this sounds to be completely ridiculous, something we don't see every day. But let's go not talk about life and death, but about the impact of quantum mechanics for something else, for information technology. I recall that computers and communication devices today work by manipulating bits. Bits are the fundamental unit of information. They are encoded in physical systems which have two states, something which is charge or discharge, a current which goes this way or this way or a little magnet which points up or points down. And then what computers do is that they take strings of zeros and ones, or of these two-level systems. They take strings of them and manipulate them. That is what we call a computation. Well, in communication, if you use your cellular phone, what it does is takes a strings of zero and one and send it through some media to somebody else, you receive it, and then you have nice software which translates it into voice. But at the end, it's just a manipulation of bits. The superposition of quantum mechanics allows you to have your bits of information to be in zero and one at the same time. The one that in your cell phone can be in zero or one, but just by changing zero and one, something new happens. In fact, for one bit, it's not that interesting. But if you have two of them, you can be in zero, zero, 
zero, one, one, zero, and one, one at the same time. So you can be in four of these classical states at the same time. If you have three of these quantum bits, you can be in zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, et cetera, up to one, one, one. You have two to the power three, or eight classical states at the same time. If you have 10 of these quantum bits, you will be in two to the power 10, which is about a thousand classical state. So that goes quite fast. 20 quantum bits or qubits, you can be in a million classical state. 30, a billion, 40, a trillion, 50, a quadrillion. And now you start to understand why people like me get excited. Because suddenly we have an exponential growth by using only a few atoms, 50 of them, we can do things that if we take all the computational power of all the computers on Earth, can r barely make it. And if one day we have computers with quadrillion amount of states on your classical devices, I'll just add 10 more quantum bits, and then it'll be very, very hard to get to that level. So what kind of things can we do with these quantum computers? Well, we can first understand what is this quantum world about, try to simulate it. Then we'll try to understand to how chemistry works at the very basic levels. We'll try to produce new types of drugs, new types of materials. But one of the most interesting applications of quantum computers, or potential application, is related to cryptography, the idea of exchanging information between two people, A and B, the computer science would call them, uh, most of you would probably call them Alice and Bob. <laughs> so in cryptography, we try to exchange information between two people. And how do we do this? We take a key that is shared between Alice and Bob. They talk to each other. They go away with their key. And then they spread the information. You take your key, you add this to your information, and then you can send it to somebody else. We can do this exactly, perfectly, in the classical world. The only problem is that we have to exchange that key between two people, and this is very cumbersome. You can imagine that every morning when you try to log into your bank or to your office securely, then you would have to go first to go and get your keys. So what computer scientists and cryptography people have done is that they have reduced this idea into not using random keys, but something which is pseudo-random something which looks approximately random. And what is sort of random? Matica mathematical problems that you cannot solve exactly. And so, or which are very, very hard to solve. And it turns out that what quantum computers are good at is to solve these mathematical problems. And if we could build quantum computers today, we would be able to create complete havoc in the world of cryptography, which is quite an unexpected result. So you might well say, let's stop this research and not go further in there. But quantum mechanics come with a twist. Not only we can break codes, but we can make new sets of codes. And this, we use a different property of quantum mechanics. The first one was the superposition principle. The second one is that if we try to observe a quantum system, we cannot do it without perturbing it. Every time we try to gather information about a quantum system, we kind of Take all it in such a way that it'll change its shape, its form, its description. And it can turn out that you can do cryptography with this. I mentioned to you how cryptography work, exchanging information between two people. The cumbersome part was to exchange the key. And you need to have a way secure to exchange this key. You cannot put it in the post, because if there's an eavesdropper who take, who's in the middle, will look at your key and decode. But in the quantum world, you can do it in such a way that you can detect if there's an eavesdropper. This seems to be like magic. In fact, Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced technology looks like magic. This looks like one. But interestingly enough, there's about a dozen of places around the world who have these devices, prototypes, who works. There's one here in Waterloo. If you are walking around the town, there are photons, particles of light, who are flying around the skies, who are encoding information and are being used for cryptography. In fact, one of the dreams that we have is not only have a local network around the town, in, uh, around the town but also to link from 
Earth up to satellite. And if we are able to do this, we'll be able to bring global security around the planet with this new form of information privacy. Quantum information technologies and this revolution about quantum computing is not only about technology, but also really coming back to ask what really is reality. I mentioned to you that suddenly object can be here and there at the same time. What does that mean? How would you feel if you would be here and there at the same time? And if every time somebody would try to observe you, suddenly you would be perturbed, what does that mean? And what we've learned is that quantum mechanics is redefining reality at a very, very small scale in such a way that it is very different than the one that we perceive, the one which is safe as secure, solid like this floor. In the quantum world, things are much more different. They are vague, fuzzy, and we're trying to understand what does that mean for our world as we build quantum devices and go to larger and larger scale. So only this reality of the microscopic world will come in and creep in in ours, and we'll start to re redefine reality the same way as probably Galileo redefined reality when he thought about the Earth turning around the sun instead of the other way around. We are just at the beginning of understanding what does that mean for the science, for the technology, for the so potential social impact, and for the philosophical impact of doing the research in quantum field. As we seek more and more answers, we'll go into a new direction that we cannot even imagine today. As we try to better understand, predict, control, and turn all of this into technology, and think about all of this has really been motivated by curiosity. Thank you very much.